Let us get started here. I'm going to invite up Doug McFadden to introduce our next talk, uh, which is Act to Enact, Moving from Cohort Discovery to Research. So Doug, take it away. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Mark. Can people hear me? OK, good. So I'm Doug McFadden. I've uh, been working with uh, Harvard Catalyst and uh, the informatics group there uh, for around 15 years. Uh, today, I'm going to be introducing the ENACT session. Uh, for those of you that may not be familiar with ENACT, um, ENACT is sort of the second generation of funding from NCATS. The first funding around was called ACT. Um, and this is to build a network across CTSA sites, uh, ideally all CTSAs across the country, uh, to be able to do the uh, electronic medical record queries. Um, it, the, the last time I looked, there was well over 100 million people in the, uh, in the network. So it's, a, it's an impressive quantity of uh, a percentage of the US populations in there. Um, so I'd like to introduce the, the two people who will be uh, uh, speaking and panel today. Uh, first, uh, Sham, who heads up uh, the informatics component for an act um, and Jeff Klan, who has been in the ITB2 world forever and uh, has been doing a lot of data quality work. So why don't you come on up guys. Uh, thank you, Doug, for that uh, introduction. Uh, so for this coming hour, um, the plan is basically, I will give you sort of this big picture view of ENACT uh, for the first half, and then in the second half, Jeff will come and talk about data quality that we are doing in this uh, project. So uh, the previous version of this project, which is ACT, which stands for Accrual to Clinical Trials, was headed up, I think we started in 2015, 2016, and it was headed up by these four institutions you see there, uh, which includes Harvard, UT Southwestern, Pitt, and San Diego. So these the CTSA PIs of these four institutions actually got funding to solve one of this longstanding uh, challenges that NIH has, which is a lot of the clinical trials fail because they're unable to accrue sufficient patients into these trials. And so ACT was set up as a way to see whether you can take inclusion exclusion criteria and figure out roughly how many people, how many patients you can get into a project, into a study. Uh, so the next generation that we are moving into is called ENACT, and I'll talk about that. So, uh, so ACT was set up just to do core discovery. And uh, by the time the funding finished up for ACT, which was more than two years ago, uh, we had linked pretty much every CTSA hub uh, across the country. It's a federated EHR data network where the EHR data was focused mainly on coded uh, data. Um, the technology that we use is Shrine and I2B2 in um, ACT. Uh, and so uh, the next version of uh, ACT, which got refunded about a year ago now, uh, the goal is now to move it into research. So imagine that we can do research maybe in hours from pretty much a significant proportion of the country's population. So that's where we are headed. So the kinds of questions we want to answer are both uh, hypothesis generation kind of questions, as well as research questions, and even clinical evidence generation kind of questions. So here are some examples, which are actually uh, real world examples that people have actually uh, done on the network. Um, so one of the earliest ones was, imagine that COVID is just starting up and, you know, clinicians are coming up and asking, um, they think that myocarditis is uh, a complication of COVID and they want to know whether younger patients are at higher risk uh, for COVID myocarditis. So this is kind of an emerging disease kind of question. And I'll show you uh, what we did on the network and how it lined up with what CDC eventually did a bigger, deeper study. Uh, and then there's a whole slew of sort of comparative uh, 
safety kind of questions. So uh, both ACE inhibitors and uh, ARBs are recommended as first line agents for treating hypertension. Um, but one of the questions which has been coming up with, uh, especially with Southeast Asians and South Asian populations, they tend to have a much uh, higher rate of side effects with ACE inhibitors, especially nocturnal cough. Um, and the question is, it's really not been totally um, delineated in the literature whether that's really the case. And uh, uh, there were people who actually um, ran some queries on the network to figure this out, whether ACE inhibitors are, have a higher rate of uh, side effects uh, for this particular subpopulation. Um, and then the third one is uh, providing evidence, however um, sort of dirty it might be for clinical care, because we know that a lot of uh, decisions that are made in clinical care, probably only about 20, 25% of them are based on um, RCT kind of evidence or guideline-based evidence. And the rest of it is really based on experience. And often clinicians will go to the most experienced clinician in the institution and say, what do you do in this complicated case? So here is an example. This actually comes from one of the uh, CTS APIs, uh, had a calf muscle tear and was going to go on this long haul flight to the other side of the world. And the question was, um, are you at higher risk of deep vein thrombosis? And uh, uh, Queries were run on the network and it showed uh, probably yes. And so he underwent uh, ultrasound scanning to look for deep vein thrombosis. Um, and there was actually thrombosis and eventually he didn't take the flight. So these are kind of some example kind of questions we want to be able to answer through this federated network. Uh, so I'll just focus on some of the informatics goals and probably not all of them. Um, and I'm going to leave out all the regulatory and uh, uh, the communication plans that uh, ENACT is working on. I and mean, that's a whole lot of heavy lifting, which is being done by the other PIs in this uh, network. So the informatics ones, and I'll just briefly touch on these, um, is uh, one of the key a strength of this network has been the ontology, which essentially harmonizes the data uh, across the network. And this ontology has been leveraged in other projects too, as you saw, even like the recovered project is using pieces of the ontology. And so one of the goals is to expand this ontology out to new domains. Um, the other thing that we are looking into and we are starting to work on is to add, to go beyond the structured data which would now look at clinical text data and use NLP to add to the data. Um, a mechanism by which we can share computable phenotypes. I mean, this is a long-standing issue we have had is while the eMERGE network and these other networks have created phenotypes which have been validated, um, there is really no good way to share the computable version of it. And the question is, can we do that in this network? Um, and since we are moving into research, we really need a robust data quality uh, process. And so that's something that Jeff will talk about in the second half of the session. Um, and also I'll briefly touch upon the analytics because that's what we really want to support and show that how this network can do these three ways of analytics, uh, which I call here counts, federated and centralized. And eventually we want to be able to develop uh, new informatics tools and analytics and enable subsets of the sites on this network to maybe even write grants and build new tools and uh, leverage the infrastructure which is already in place. Um, because that's kind of one of the missions of the CTSA to be able to do that. So, uh, so one of the charges that we got from NCATS when ACT first started up is to be compatible with the common data models around there. And so we've kind of gotten probably after all these years to the first step is that the new version of the ontology, which will be coming out pretty soon, is compatible with OMOP. So now the network is truly uh, interoperable between I2B2 and OMOP. So you can set up 
at a particular site, an OMOP data repository, um, and it will uh, be compatible with the ACT uh, ontology. So for a user, it will be transparent. Uh, you don't have to know whether a particular site is using I2B2 or OMOP. Uh, the ontology will take care of uh, that. And briefly, the way uh, that works is that uh, in the ontology, uh, we are basically translating the codes that we have in the ACT ontology, which is basically based on the standard terminologies uh, that you see in the EHR, things like ICDs and CPTs, Rx norm and LOINC, which is what we use, while OMOP has got this own concept uh, list where they translate everything into an OMOP concept. So what this ontology basically does is now that it's uh, underneath, uh, say, an ICD code, it also collects the OMOP uh, codes. And sometimes there are OMOP codes which really don't fit into any of the standard terminologies, and so those are kind of grayed out. Uh, but the query will actually look for those codes when it hits uh, an OMOP uh, repository. And so this is our first uh, step to make it compatible with OMOP. And uh, once we have sorted this out, then we will look, look at the PicoNet uh, CDM. Uh, so the other piece is going to be, as we put in more data domains um, into the local data repositories, uh, we will need additional ontologies to be able to query this. So one primary example of this is uh, where there's been a lot of interest is there's more and more genetic data flowing in through the lab systems nowadays in the hospital systems. But we really don't have the ontology yet set up to query that very well, the genetic variants. So creating an ontology for that is uh, ongoing. Uh, the other area uh, which we are working on is uh, the NLP derived concepts. Um, one of the areas uh, we are really interested in, in social determinants of health. So setting up an ontology for that is an ongoing piece of work. And also generating computed phenotypes. So this work actually started with COVID. Uh, for example, in COVID, one of the things that researchers cared a lot about was uh, outcomes uh, like say respiratory therapy management. And they wanted um, like this four or five uh, conditions that the WHO cared about or the CDC had defined, and they didn't want to actually figure out what the underlying codes were, which would capture these definitions. So we created these definitions, um, like say intubation, for example, uh, which would go under respiratory therapy management. So we will be doing a fair amount of that kind of additional uh, computable phenotypes. Uh, and there was the other thing that we did during the COVID era was when, COVID lab tests started coming out, the results were all over the place. There was no standardization. And uh, so we standardized the ontology to have just these four values and everybody had to map to that. Uh, so there'll be additional work which these ontologies uh, will capture, which goes just beyond your standard terminology uh, terms that you have. And then as I've mentioned, um, NLP is an area where we just started a new working group um, and is uh, led by Ian Shan Wang at Pitt. Uh, he's got about 10 um, of the ACT sites currently in this working group. They're focusing on different areas um, to do extraction of NLP concepts. So the idea here is that we, would, we don't want to start off extracting everything out of every note and sticking it into the data repository. We're going to focus on what the sites want, um, which are currently in the working group, and they're going to build lightweight pipelines to extract those concepts. And then they get tested out first across these 10 sites, and then it goes to the network. And then uh, we'll be building new ontologies which can then query the concepts uh, derived from this NLP work. Um, which goes on. So even though we have started out with this sort of curated set of uh, 10 sites, uh, we will open this up so that other sites can also join this working group uh, as we go along. Uh, 
The other thing we have sort of, I guess at this point, pretty much opened this up is a, uh, is a plugin that was developed actually quite some time back by the work was actually started by Luisa who is here and now it's led by Kevin. Uh, so this Sheriff tool is basically an I2B2 plugin and it allows you to um, upload um, complex queries um, into the cloud and you can also download these queries and as long as uh, your ontology is compatible with the ontology that generated the original query then it should run it should just execute uh, automatically and so this is a tool which we have tested um, the plugin should be available i think by the end of the month so that people can download it and actually install it in their i2b2s and uh, there's also going to be a web access to this browsable library so you don't have to be necessarily an i2b2 user you can just go on to the web version of it and look at what kinds of computable phenotypes are available in it. Uh, we're also hoping to take uh, most of the work that Emerge has done and to the extent it can be mapped into queries which run on coded data, put them into this library so that you'll have sort of approximate executable versions of the Emerge phenotypes. Um, and uh, and it's, you can also roll uh, sort of annotations and metadata into these queries when you upload them into the library because typically uh, when people set up queries for a particular study often you'll have one query for cases maybe multiple queries for cases the way they define their cases and at least one query for controls and so you can bundle them all up and export them up to this cloud um, and uh, uh, we'll attach metadata to it so that people can browse through it and see what evidence there is that these queries have been validated, for example. Um, and maybe at some point we'll have a more curated version of these uh, uh, computable phenotypes where we can say, no, these have actually been vetted and people have done validation studies and uh, these are the performance metrics that go along with these queries. But right now we're just starting out with a way to enable people to upload and download these queries and browse through them. Uh, the other big thing is the data quality and um, since ACT began, we have always had uh, this uh, smoke test, uh, which is kind of a very basic data quality as well as the network connectivity process, uh, which uh, Doug McFadden and Griffin, they run this on a weekly basis across the network which tells us how these nodes are working and whether they're connecting um, and also tells us whether the mapping to some extent in these domains are good. Uh, but in addition to this, uh, this uh, and Jeff will talk about this uh, in great detail next, is this data quality dashboard which is being built by his group. Uh, so this is going to be a centralized dashboard but each of the sites will have uh, metrics um, which will be specific to them so that the site can then compare themselves to the other sites on the network. And the idea is that uh, every time each site refreshes the data, which hopefully is at least once a month, then automatically uh, all the counts that we need will get pushed into this centralized dashboard. Uh, and Jeff will talk a lot more in detail about the kinds of things we will be looking at, like outliers, missingness, data mapping, variation, temporal trends, etc. So the first goal of this dashboard is really for the informatics and the ETL folks, so that they can look at uh, any issues about their data at the local site. But we also hope that there's going to be a version of this dashboard which will expose some of the statistics to the users of the network, so that um, sometimes users need to know like, okay, what's the N or the number of patients a particular site has? And it seems like you, you really don't want to run a query to get to that number. So the dashboard will have it. And so if you expose things like that, then they can actually look at this and very quickly know some of these basic statistics without having to run queries. And then finally, the analytics. Uh, 
So since this is the only network which has got real-time capability of querying the data, um, some analytics can be run through the Shrine interface, which connects in real time to the data repositories and essentially produces patient counts. Um, and so uh, you would think that just using counts, you really can't do much research, but it turns out that you can. A fair amount of research can be done with just counts. Uh, but obviously to do any kind of deeper analytics, you need to be able to get to the row level data. And there are two ways to do that. Uh, one is distributed analytics, where the code gets shipped out to each site and, uh, uh, and then it gets run locally. It collects the summary statistics, sends it back to the central place where it's all put together. And then there is the on-play version where the data gets pushed centrally. And so in this network, we hope to do all three of this because there are probably um, pros and cons of each approach. And um, I'll probably give you a little bit of details about how this is going to work. So this is, uh, so with patient counts, so here's the example of this acute myocarditis that I mentioned earlier. So this was something that uh, my CTSA PI, who is the, one of the NAC PIs ran, since he's a cardiologist, he just wanted to know what the incidence of acute myocarditis. And so the ACT network, uh, basically provided this information that was 0.045%. And it did match up with uh, pretty closely with what had been published, which is 450 per million. So even with not having um, our data quality process all in place and all that stuff, and the data is kind of probably noisy and dirty, you're still able to get to estimates which look pretty decent. And then the second question was at that time, um, do younger people have a higher incidence of myocarditis? And this again comes from the ACT network and it shows yes, that if you are uh, younger between the 16 to 24, you have a higher rate. And eventually CDC had published similar statistics. And all this came out of just, I think it's a couple of hours worth of work uh, by running these queries. So this is uh, the query about uh, this deep vein thrombosis. Uh, and if you have a calf muscle injury, are you at higher risk? And the query here was basically looking at an ICD code for lower extremity muscle strain and whether they were being treated with anticoagulants. And based on that uh, query, it showed that two to 5% of the patients with a tear uh, were on anticoagulants, and we presume that they were on it because of uh, thrombosis. And just based on that fact, uh, uh, this PI, uh, this person was referred by the primary care for a deep vein thrombosis evaluation. So distributed analytics, uh, so this is the approach which really was applied at a very large scale by the 4CE project, which which Zach Kohani heads up and Griffin and Sean and I have been deeply involved in. And um, I, I would guess that most of, many of the sites in the US are really ACT sites, which are participating in this network. And so we would like to leverage that in the ENACT network um, where uh, we would welcome additional projects which would do this kind of distributed analytics. And so one particular example I can give you is that Hussein History has got a, a funded project which is looking at long COVID phenotypes and he had this uh, session uh, yesterday. And it's basically you leveraging the enact sites because of the harmonization of the data which is done uh, to be able to run these distributed analytics. And then for the central analytics, uh, so this is, the big difference here with this network is going to be compared to other similar projects like say N3C is that this is going to be temporary. So we are not going to be looking at taking everybody's data and sticking it in one place centrally because uh, what the CTS APIs have found is that that's going to be a no-go um, in terms of getting the hospitals to sign off. So currently, uh, this is being led up by Mike Hogart at UC San Diego. Um, 
and it's going to use the AWS platform with the usual kinds of tools like Python and R. Uh, the administration of the platform itself currently is going to be with San Diego because they have experience doing it locally. And the goal is to be able to transfer after cohort uh, discovery has been done uh, using Shrine to take uh, limited data sets from the sites which are willing to donate the data uh, for study specific cohorts. So move it to this platform and analytics can be done there. And the idea is that the data set would basically exist only for the duration of the study. So here the heavy lifting is more on the governance and the regulatory side than on actually the technical side. In fact, the technical aspect is pretty much all set to go at this point uh, in terms of uh, provisioning these platform uh, for study specific data sets. And so over the next six months, it's gonna be this governance and regulatory framework that is being developed to be able to do this. So I'll just wrap up um, by saying that uh, one of the uh, downsides of the new funding that we got for ENACT is that in the previous version, every participating site got a little bit of funding to refresh their data and to do other activities, while in the new funding, uh, we just didn't have enough funds to be able to do that for um, all the sites which are part of the network. So we are pretty, we're very cognizant of that. So we want to try and automate as much as possible uh, the various aspects of the informatics um, goals that we have for the network and also uh, do a lot of informatics activities, which is of interest to the local sites. Uh, so to have them drive that. Um, so in terms of centralized things that we hope we can simplify is ontology upgrades. So right now it's, it's a fair amount of work to take the files, go through this checklist and install it at a local site. And so we are building a tool which should be ready soon and, um, and you might hear about it tomorrow is uh, essentially the terminologies, the ontology will sit up on the cloud and you can just click a button and download it through a plugin into the I2B2 and it'll install itself. Uh, so we're hoping that will simplify this ontology upgrades. Um, and then access to the data quality uh, should be helpful for the local sites because you can use your data repositories for local users also. Um, and the way we want to get to the statistics, uh, we will automate that too, so that every time the data refreshes, you just run another script, which will do everything that we need for the data quality so that it doesn't have to be a separate process, which requires a lot of time. Uh, we have started holding this period of periodic informatics office hours because what we have found with the mailing list is that really uh, putting your problem out there on the mailing list, uh, someone has already seen this problem often and they'll come up and say, this is what we did. And so the office hours are there just to do this more uh, sort of in a synchronous fashion and add on to the mailing list. And uh, finally, one of the things we really want to enable is support other grant funding and projects using the NACT platform. And it doesn't have uh, so you don't have to necessarily propose a project or write a grant which says you're going to do this for the entire network. You can basically say subset of the sites which are involved in the network is what this grant will look at uh, or part, uh, the participants will be just a subset. And that is totally fine because we think that the way um, you want to develop new informatics processes and technologies is really do it with a small subset who are interested in it and then figure out how to translate it for the entire network. And so we are happy to support these kind of grant applications by providing a letter of support, as well as uh, providing some project management and even maybe setting up work groups that people can meet and talk about how to move these uh, new ideas uh, forward. And yeah, so with that, uh, so that was just a very high level view and actually probably didn't talk about all the informatics things, um, especially including the new versions of I2B2 and Shrine, which are going to be deployed on the network because there's probably going to be sessions which will talk about uh, those capacities too.
Um, and I think, yeah, I can take a few questions before Jeff comes on. Thank you for your wonderful talk. So what might be the roadmap of the platform to further integrate with the multi-omics data set, like our genomics, transcriptomics, metabolomics? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. Uh, we are still heavily focused on EHR data. And even there, right now, it's just coded data that we are providing. And we're trying as a first step just to move to text data. Um, in terms of the omics and other kinds of research data, I think the next step would be to probably bring in some kind of genomics data, uh, partly because some of the genomics are flowing through clinical care. And so you do see them in the EHR. Uh, and there's also another project, which is a network-based project that Ken Mendel leads called the Genomic Information Commons, which is very similar to this network, except that they're adding genomic data for pediatric sites. So there are about 10 sites involved in that. And so I think learning how that network is able to bring in the genomics data. So the technology is being laid out, uh, especially if you want to put in like uh, massive amounts of variant data for a person into something like an I2B2 data repository. How do you do it? How do you efficiently access it? All the technology is being built in that project and potentially we could leverage that uh, eventually to the ACT network, the NAC network. Thank you. 